I want to get. I just want to get right in, right into the sermon this morning again for the sake of time. Um, uh, appointments of elders, you know, these kind of like family moments in the church, I think are great times to reflect on what the Bible has to say about uh, the, the leaders and the servants who are in the church. And what is the relationship between the church and the elders and between Jesus and the church and the elders? And how does that look? Twelve years ago, I heard a sermon by a man named Greg Haswell, and uh, he, he taught on this, and it permanently changed my understanding of what it means to be a pastor. In fact, the the language and vocabulary from that teaching is still what I use to describe my vocation um, as a pastor, which I, I've, I've been a pastor now for um, about 11 years. And so I want to share some of that with you, and I want to build on some of the things that he said with the goal that we uh, leave this morning with a richer, more Christ-like understanding of the relationships between Jesus, the church, and those who lead and serve her. So I'm going to read from Ephesians 4. Uh, starting in verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who ascended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined together, held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Man, that is just a soaring passage on the church. And uh, just such exalted language and ideas. There is one body and there is one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. And then in the next verses, it goes on to say, one God, but many gifts. He who ascended, Jesus Christ, left gifts for men. And he left all kinds of gifts. Some of them are apostles, and they left prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers. And what do they do? Well, they equip the saints for the work of ministry. They help the church become who she is meant to be, and for the sake of building up the body. So I guess a question we're thinking about is, do we think of our pastors as gifts? It's something Eric pointed out is, you know, over in Rome is, as well, it says that's what they are. Do we Think of them as gifts. What makes a pastor a gift? What's the point of the gift? Well, it's to build the body into Christ. That's the whole purpose. It's as if to say we would look less like Jesus if we didn't have pastors. But understanding how that works and how the gifts of the church actually do that, I think, requires something of the mystery of the church. I mean, the body of Christ is a bona fide mystery. Now, I know if we look around, we don't feel very mysterious. (laughs) We're very normal people in, in, um, in so many ways. But uh, in, in Ephesians, earlier in this same letter in Ephesians, Paul says that the mystery hidden for ages in God is revealed in the church. The mystery of God is revealed in the church. And what is that mystery? Well, later in Ephesians 5, so you skip ahead a couple chapters, Paul comes back to that. He's talking about marriage. He's, he's talking about what happens between a man and a woman. He says, by the way, this mystery is about Christ in the church. The heart of the mystery is that God wants to be united to people. God likes people. And the plan was not merely for Jesus to wear flesh, although that's a huge part of the story, isn't it? I mean, God likes human beings so much he became one. But the plan wasn't for Jesus just to wear flesh, but to be united to all flesh. 
Ephesians 4 says that he's going to you know, fill all things. Rome, uh, sorry, 1 Corinthians 15, that great passage on the resurrection says, one day God is going to fill all in all. We have yet to understand what it will be like when God fully unites himself to all flesh. It will be extraordinary. That's the mystery of resurrection life. It's astonishing. And uh, the language of that coming together, the language of that union, again, is, is um, of the most intimate kind. Where Paul really explains it in Ephesians 5, he says, look, it's, the best way to think about it is to think about what happens between a man and a woman. It's an intimate kind of union. It's a, it's a bridal and a marital union. The church is a bride waiting for her husband, and he is waiting for her. I've been studying in uh, Genesis, and I read something that just so grabbed me. Um, Genesis, the story of creation in Genesis 1 and 2 um, is remarkable, especially when compared to other creation stories from the ancient Near East. There's many things about it that make it kind of radical, but some scholars say the most radical thing about the Genesis story compared to the other ancient creation stories is that there is no female deity. There's no female God. There is no consort for Yahweh. So so if you're reading the Old Testament as an ancient person, you read it and you're kind of wondering, where is the bride of God? And then in the New Testament, you find out she is us. The mystery is that the father is finding a consort, a loving bride for his son, and seeking her out and preparing her. And so the task of the church is to be the bride, to become what the father has called her to be, and that is the point of the gifts. Now, there's a lot of metaphors in the Bible, word pictures, we need them all. The bridal metaphor is astonishingly big. And it exists in more places than we realize because we are not always familiar with Jewish wedding customs. And so there's actually many more allusions to bridal pageantry in the Bible than than we realize. We may not even think of pastors in the context of bridal imagery, but I think that if we do, it will shape how we think of them and how we think of how they serve us and lead us. I think they speak to moments like we're having today. Um, So when it's Just briefly explain a little bit about how, in the times of the Bible, how ancient Jews would go about the process of getting hitched, how they would covenant together in marriage. So when a young man is getting married, his father would often send out servants to go find a bride. We actually see that's in the Bible. You know, Abraham sends out servants to find a bride for Isaac. And the fathers would then make arrangements, and they would get the young man and the young lady together, and of course, they'd be chaperoned. And if everything's going well, the fathers would say, uh, let's get them married. And so a price would be set, a bride price, and the father of the groom would pay, because in those days, it was, um, you know, the sons would contribute to the wealth of the family. And so the father of the groom honors what the father of the bride has done by, by um, sacrificing and preparing this young lady for his son. So the bride price would be paid, and then there would be an engagement supper, and that supper is is an engagement supper, but it it was considered as binding in their day as marriage is considered in our day, which is why, you know, you may have wondered, why does Joseph talk about divorcing Mary when they're only betrothed? It's because the covenant had actually been established, even though it was merely an engagement or betrothal kind of covenant. And so the supper was where this would happen, this, this supper. And so there's a bit of formality. The groom would take a cup of wine and he'd offer it to his prospective bride and she would, she would receive the cup from him and drink of it. And that was part of the ceremony in which it was her way of essentially saying yes. So you see what happens at the last supper when Jesus takes bread and then he takes the cup and he gives it to his disciples and he says, this cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. The covenant is made today. And they drink of the cup. And then the, bride, the bridegroom, after the ceremony is over, he would, he would go away and he would, you know, leave gifts for her. And, and of course, we know that Jesus left for us the, the premier gift, the deposit of the Holy Spirit, right? And then after this ceremony, this engagement ceremony, the bridegroom would go away with his father and he would go to build a house or in some cases, he would just build either a, his house would be like an extra room on his father's house. And they would go away. And this process could take, you know, up to a year. And it was only when the father, the, 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 the father was the one who said, when it's ready, the son is antsy. The, the son's ready, probably a little too quick to say, it's good. <laughs> the father's not under that kind of pressure. <laughs> and so it's only when the father says, 
that the son can go back and marry his, his bride. So Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house, there's many rooms. And no one knows when I'm going to return except the father. It's the father's timing. It's his choice. And so this, this father, if, he's a, if he was a wealthy uh, man or perhaps even a king, he would leave servants to protect his investment. He's paid quite a price for this young lady. And so he would leave warriors to protect her, handmaidens to help get her nice and beautiful. And they were servants of the bride, attendants of the bride. And so Ephesians 4 says that he who ascended left gifts. It was he who gave some to be apostles and prophets and teachers and pastors and so on. That language is the language of generosity. It's the language of granting, of bestowing. And so Jesus is saying, look, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you gifts who are going to help prepare you. They're going, to help, they're going to help you get beautiful for my return. Now, when the bridegroom finished the house, he would then uh, return to pick up his bride. And her job over that year, she'd be oftentimes preparing her own wedding dress. She'd be uh, putting her dress together, getting herself ready. And there was this kind of, kind of a fun custom that um, uh, oftentimes when the bridegroom would come back, he would come, um, it would be a surprise. And he would often come at night. He would come kind of steal, steal his bride. He, uh, bride stealing was this kind of in a, in a fun way. And the whole town would be in on it. And so nobody knew he was going to come, but when he would come, those on the outside of the town would make a big racket and let everybody know that he's coming. And then, of course, all the handmaidens would have to come out with, their, with, with lights, right? Because it's is like, you know, first century Israel and they're not street lamps. So, you know, it's dark. And so they come out to kind of light the way. Uh, and so Jesus gives us the parable of the virgins and says, you servants, will you be ready when I return? Will there be oil in your lamps when I come to fetch my bride? So we know, you know, the the metaphor is not hard to understand, right? Jesus is the bridegroom, the church is the bride. These attendants, who are these attendants, these warriors and handmaidens? Well, they are every person who stands up to serve the bride. That's pastors and that's teachers, that's Sunday school teachers, that's that's all of us. But that is probably, the I, I think, the best way of thinking about what pastors are. They are attendants of the bride. Leaders, yes, but I mean, Eric and I were just talking about that. This, that you know, lead, leader, leadership is, is a good word, but there's a better one. Servants. That word comes up in the New Testament over a hundred times. It's what pastors do. Is they, they, they're tasked with serving her, preparing her. Now, if you are the father of this groom, it's your son who's going to be married to this Beautiful bride, you have to, you're going to leave warriors. Which warriors are you going to pick? Are you going to send your 10 most handsome, most available, <laughs> most strapping young lads? Are you going to send your 10 most charming? Greg Haswell, I'm just going to quote him directly because this was so good. He said, if you are a rich king, you send your 10 best warriors. But if you are a wise king, you make them eunuchs first. <laughs> Because the eunuch, what is the role of the eunuch? It's someone who cannot take pleasure from someone else's bride. So the groom can say with confidence to his bride, listen, my father has sent servants, these eunuchs, and these handmaidens, they're here for you. I want you to listen to them and, and, and obey them because they're here to help you. And if they get out of, out of line, by the way, they're going to answer for that. When I come back, they're going to answer for that. And then imagine he pulls the eunuchs aside. What do you think he says to them? What kind of charge? What kind of warning? 1 Corinthians 4 says that those entrusted with the charge must be found faithful. And we live in an age where there has been some unfaithful servants in the church. And I know many of you are intimately familiar with that kind of thing. We live in an age of pastoral abuse. Many attendants of the bride have abused her for their own benefit. What will the bridegroom say? When he returns, what kind of darkness is reserved for those men and women who have abused the bride while whispering in her ear, this is what the bridegroom really wants. Now, those who've been given a responsibility must prove faithful and they're going to give an account. So I think this metaphor of attendance and and eunuchs is a helpful one. And um, good news, Pat, where's Pat? It's only a metaphor. Um, There will actually not be castrations after service. (laughs) 
There are other jokes, but I feel like I may be getting on thin ice. So I'm going to move on. I want to extract just a few principles from this metaphor this morning. Uh, First, attendants of the bride are gifts to bless the bride, not the other way around. Attendance of the bride, like the direction of blessing, the primary direction of blessing is important. The church is not a gift to the pastor so that he will have a platform to showcase his gifting. Right? The primary calling, again, the primary calling of the pastor is not even leadership. The primary calling is service. So, should churches encourage their pastors and pray for them? Yes, absolutely. They must do that. But the church is not there to validate the needs of the pastor. And it is easy to forget that. Uh, Very often, churches become overly associated with the face of their under-shepherds. The head of the body is Christ, not the servants. And too often, pastors and people in the church think that somehow the church is an extension of the pastor's ministry. Like, we're all there to support his thing. Like, the pastor is more anointed, more prized, more precious to the bridegroom than the bride. (laughs) Like the bride is there to make him look good. What will the bridegroom say? Should he return and find his eunuchs and servants are using the bride for their benefit to make themselves look good? What will the bridegroom say if he comes back and finds out that actually the bride has been serving the servants? That's the other way around. And so everything that elders do should be thought of in this way. And people have categorize that, you know, what, what do elders do? You could dip, approach this different ways. A helpful grid is like, as, uh, that a lot of people have kind of referred to is like these th- three words that all start with D. There's doctrine. So elders, one of their jobs is to watch over what does the bride believe and confess? Is she thinking right things about her bridegroom? Is she remembering what he's really like? Discipline. So there's doctrine, then there's discipline. Is she remaining pure and resisting temptation and making herself beautiful? And direction. Those are all the practical practical considerations of how the bride lives and exists in the world now while she's waiting. I heard a pastor once say that we should perhaps add another D to that list. Beyond doctrine, discipline, and direction, elders also are responsible in the area of death. If anyone's going to suffer in the church... If there's going to be sacrifice, the elders ought to be first in line because they are there to bless the church, to protect her, not be protected by her. So the first principle here is really around the direction of blessing. That doesn't mean the church shouldn't bless its pastors. Don't hear what I'm not saying. Please bless them. But just know their job is to bless you. Secondly, attendance of of the bride should increase the bride's affection for the bridegroom, not themselves. So this is a related issue. And it is the, the direction of affection and of loves. When the father of the groom left servants for his bride, how do, you think they expected, how do you think he expected them to speak of his son while they're gone? Everything they say about him should be increasing her joy and excitement in anticipation of his return. And the spirit of that has not been captured by anyone better than John the Baptist. So you know the story in John 3, that John's disciples, they're all irritated because you know his followers are all going over to Jesus. They're having a bit of an identity crisis. And what does he say to them? He basically says, what are you nuts? What do you think we're doing here? It says, you yourselves bear me witness that I said I'm not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. What would have happened if John had taken the view of his disciples? What if he had had an identity crisis and started manipulating people to stay with him? What kind of judgment would come? One of the worst things an attendant can do is to take pleasure from the bride. To stroke her and flatter her, whisper in her ear, and, and, and over time, steal the affection. 
the affection that is due to the groom to steal it for himself. This is why in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus, character is the number one thing necessary in pastors. We know much more in the Bible about the kinds of people pastors should be, much more than even what they should do. Who they are matters more than what they do. Their character is paramount. I'm not saying what they do doesn't matter, but nothing is more important than character because it takes a lot of character not to steal affection when you could. They must take on the role of spiritual eunuchs. They must resist the temptation to take the praise due to Jesus and invite it for themselves, and it is very hard to do. You know, I'm a pastor, and I'm not a pastor in this church, but I'm a pastor in another church, and this is hard. There is nothing more spiritually dangerous that I've ever done than preach, I think. Every Sunday that I go to preach, and I did it this morning, I, I pray some form of a prayer where I, I look to the Lord and say, I know I'm supposed to do this only to make you look good, and I'm not supposed to care what people think about me, but I don't know how to do that. If you don't help me, I'm going to do this for the wrong reason. But if you do help me, I'll, I'll do it for you. It's hard work. It takes character to not steal affection when you could. And so this doesn't mean you shouldn't encourage your pastors. No, you should, but encourage them in the Lord. Encourage them in the Lord. Listen, I don't need to hear people tell me that I'm a great preacher, and I don't know that I'm a terribly great preacher, but I, I don't need to hear that all the time. In fact, I would say that's, a, that's the kind of thing it's probably not good for me to hear, but I can't hear enough that God uses me to make other people love Jesus more. That's great encouragement. Hey, pastor. Hey, Pat, you make me love Jesus more. Man, that's a gift. The third principle is really just, again, around the reason for these gifts and it is this. The reason the Father has given gifts to the bride is to make the bride ready and beautiful. The reason you have pastors is for the sake of your beauty. Or we could use the word holiness. They're the related ideas. They are here to make you holy. To make you happy and holy in the Lord. That's why, that's what we're doing here. It's what it's all about. Revelation 21 is this great, uh, this great um, passage speaking about like the end of time and you know, it's got these, this, uh, this idea that everything's going to be made new. And we all love that. Everything's going to be made new. But you know what's interesting? That um, that's actually not the climax. That's not the main point of that passage. And we don't have time to read the whole thing. So in the context of being, everything being made new, this is what happens in chapter 21, verse 9. Then John, John, this is John, his apocalypse, his vision. Then came one of the seven angels with the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. The renewing of creation is the backdrop for the revelation of the glorified church. I mean, in a wedding, what is the most significant moment of a wedding? When is the moment where everyone stares, stands, and gawks? So my wedding, Kimberly and I had the great fortune of getting married in, frankly, one of the most, probably one of the most beautiful chapels in America. Crazy story. F whole thing is made out of Florentine marble. And um, my cousin was the wedding coordinator, and she was responsible for when... <laughs> you know, hearing the cue in the music so that Kimberly would come down. And I trust she will never hear the audio recording of this. Um, but she screwed it all up. And so, <laughs> so, you guys remember this? <laughs> so, um, I'm standing at the front and everyone stands and like two minutes go by and Kimberly does not come out. And now two minutes does not sound a long time <laughs> to you. <laughs> but in that circumstance, I aged years. It was long enough that people started laughing. People like snigger and look at me. Well, well, well. <laughs> Guess who didn't show up? <laughs> this is the moment everyone's waiting for. We're in a beautiful, beautiful chapel, but everyone came to see her. The revelation of the bride. That is how history, that's how this chapter of history ends, is with this great moment. Genesis opens, and ancient people would have read it and wondered, where is the bride of God? Revelation ends by saying she's here. Look what God did. He took us, man. 
normal, everyday people and transformed all of us into the most beautiful thing that angels have ever seen. Second only to the beauty of Christ. Why does the church need prophets? To help her get ready. Why teachers and evangelists? To help her get ready. Your elders and monument, they are great servants. And I know these men. Eric has been a close friend of mine, Eric and Celeste, for 10 years now. Could talk at length about what his friendship has meant to me. I, I can't say enough about this man's character. He has been a friend to me in times where I feel like no one understands actually what I'm going through except him. And I've gotten to know Travis and Jim and let me tell you something, you have great elders, not because they have spectacular gifts and they do have some, but because they're great servants and they love the bridegroom and they love to serve him. I am in Moorhead City, but I want to tell you, I'm a pastor and I'm also a sheep. I get shepherded in my church. When we go through things, we, need, we are sheep in need of care. And I'm telling you, I would happily be a sheep in this church. Happily. Are you a happy sheep in this church? When you're el- do, do you let your elders serve you? Do, you? do you make it easy on them? When they call for a fast, which is for your holiness and beauty, do you participate? Do you say yes? When they s- start a ministry and they ask for people to volunteer, do you cheerfully use your gifts and do you serve? Look, this romance, this mystery of the ages, the union of the Christ and the church, it's worth all things. It's worth your life, man. It's worth everything you have, your time, treasure, and talent, because the bride price has been paid in full. It's been settled. Why would we not give the little we have considering what's been given for us? What is the bride price? The death of the groom. The father is so committed to you that he said he would pay any price, including the death of his son. So when you blow it and in your sin, you think, oh my gosh, I'm tarnishing the bride. Do you know what the bridegroom says to you? And I'll close the sermon with this. I read this in a, I read this in a, in a book and just kind of imagining what Jesus as the bridegroom would, would say to his, his bride when she blows it and fails. He might say something like this, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pay the price for you and drink the cup with you and go to prepare the place for you. And if you happen to stumble in the year that I'm away, I'll just forget it. If I hear while I'm building the bridal chamber that you are not waiting for me, but had even given your love to another, I will just forget it. And if you try to break my covenant, I will not let you break it. I will not allow for it to be broken. Beloved, I will will pay for your sins all myself. And praise God, he has. Praise God, He has every day. You have the opportunity. You have the opportunity to become beautiful again. And there is nothing that you have ever done in your life that Jesus didn't know you were going to do ahead of time. And He paid the price anyway. And He has no buyer's remorse. He loves you, beloved. He loves you. And there is nothing that you will do with your life that is better than being a part of the church and helping her get ready for her groom. Amen.